Hello, and welcome to episode three of our series, Teaching Remotely, Learning Together. I'm David Bott, Associate Director at the Institute of Positive Education here at Geelong Grammar School in Australia. And in this episode, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Chris McNamara, who is Vice Principal, Global Learning and Innovation, and Rhiannon McGee, who is head of the school's positive education department. Both of these people have helped lead the school's response during these uncertain times. Chris with his focus on innovative teaching and learning, and Rhiannon with her focus on the well-being of students. I hope you find this discussion valuable, useful, and interesting. Chris and Rhiannon, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Good to see you guys. It's a, it's a little bit weird as you sit on my screen here, um, zooming in. All three of us are on campus here at Geelong Grammar, but we're all kind of on different Zoom Zoom uh, connections. It's, it's a strange situation, isn't it? How are you guys coping in general? How are you feeling? Being optimistic or challenged? How's it all going for you both? Bit of both. It's been, I think, um, challenging, obviously, uh, and wearing for teachers, educators across the globe, but also exciting um, in terms of capitalising on the opportunities um, to improve the way we do things. How are you feeling, Chris? <laughs> yeah, a little bit the same. I'm it's incredibly optimistic um, and positive about the way things have, have gone and how well people have responded in you know, what are incredibly challenging times because they're so unusual and outside of the context of how we normally operate. Um, mm. And really excited by the kind of growth and the support we've seen for people and the collegiality we've seen because yeah. um, you kind of have a sense with <coughs> our profession, while we look collegial in some ways, we're kind of like three-year-olds who play next yeah. to each other. We play them <laughs> side by side, but we don't kind of yeah. collaborate really. Yeah, integrate, kinda, yeah. It's a pretty individual well, profession. Let me let me jump in on that concept of innovation and change and growth that you've been talking about, Chris. And first question I'd love to fire at you at uh, fire at you is this: that your title is Vice Principal of Geelong Grammar School Global Learning and Innovation, and this is a role you only began at the start of this year. And I, I imagine what you've gone through in the last few months wasn't quite what you expected you'd be going through. But despite that, a VP for Global Learning and Innovation seems highly appropriate at this time. And and we're just saying off air, it's probably something that each school wishes they have. Geelong Grammar happens to have one. Just tell us a little bit about what, how, you, how the schools, how you've been contributing to Geelong Grammar's response throughout this and what role you've played. I think, I think the, glo the global learning bit is a really interesting bit at the moment because we've been doing that. Um, one of the things Rebecca and I have done has been part of a global group, which is kind of met, met every Wednesday. And in that global group, there's people in Shanghai who've been in lockdown since January to us who are probably the last in lockdown. So we've had people in the group at really different stages of lockdown. So there's been a lot of global learning from each other and sharing the experience and kind of conversa a lot of conversations about what does post-COVID look like in schools because it won't be the same and can never be the same. So that's been one of the great things is that really true sense of global learning and collegiality with other schools. Um, I think what I've seen here and what we've done well is kind of adapt as we've gone along we've kind of taken that view of let's plan two weeks at a time mm. and let's look to know that we may have to shift how we do things as the context changes but also as we notice people respond differently and students respond differently we may have to change again so we've been open to that kind of adapting our yeah. structures every couple of weeks let, let me just let me just dig into let me just dig into that a tiny bit, Chris, because I think people will be interested. Because I think what what I'm seeing in our connections around the world is is uh, each school's approaching things a little differently. I think this is uh, an in really interesting response Jill and Grammar has taken to to effectively say, let's not even think really, or let's not um, strategize too far ahead. Let's really just take it two weeks at a time because things are shifting so quickly. So so has that, that's been a, from right from the executive level down, the strategic thinking, the planning implementation has really just been in two-week blocks, no further ahead than that. Obviously, thinking further ahead, but really just zooming in on two-week blocks. Is that, that's been the approach? Yeah, and trying to support people really strategically around that two weeks. In the next two weeks, here's how things will look and this is what we'll do. Um, and then giving people a lead into whatever shift may happen in the next two weeks. And part of that's been allowing us, like I said, to respond to context as context changes, but also to see what people inside the organisation need as they respond and, and are challenged in different ways and also mm. to respond to our students. Well, you know, two weeks into remote learning, four weeks into remote learning, six weeks into remote learning, we're seeing different responses from our students and trying to change how we do things 
based on those things that we're seeing. Yeah. And, and tell me a little bit about the, the last question, Chris, and I'll throw to you, Rhiannon, but as things have changed and evolved so qu quickly, have there been a particular set of guiding principles or ha what, what's kind of guided your thinking in such a rapidly evolving environment? I think that I suppose what's guided our thinking has been our values and our, and our um, priorities as, a, as an organisation, as a school, but ultimately too what's guiding all of our decision-making us is that notion of safety that in, in a whole lot of different contexts that making sure that all of our people are safe and all of our people are healthy and looked after and that when we're making decisions about what things look like in the next two weeks, that's a number one priority for us is to respond to the health and safety of, of the people that we come in contact with and the people we're here for um, and that helps shape the decisions we make. So when we make a decision, we go through that those sort of key decision priorities in terms of are we keeping people health and healthy and are we keeping people safe? Is it a good learning environment for our students? Are we making, you know, are we helping them to grow? Um, and are we looking after and supporting people professionally um, to ensure that they feel confident and capable to deliver the next stage? Yeah, great. Oh, thanks very much. Really appreciate it, Chris. And um, such an interesting, such a, a, a pivotal pillar of what Geelong Grammar has been focusing on, it seems, is this safety, but not, not just the physical safety, but also the, 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 you know, the professional safety and making sure everyone has what they need to be able to do their jobs here. So, uh, really appreciate that. Um, Rhiannon, can I ask you this question? Because it's, it's, I've been wanting to ask you this for a while. Obviously, we work fairly closely together, um, but this has been bugging me, bothering me, sort of zipping around in my mind for the last few weeks as we've been working both inside with Geelong Grammar, but also with other schools around the world. And it's this, that um, po positive education, you know, Geelong Grammar is, is one of the world's leading positive education schools and the well-being, as Chris has just said, the safety, the mental health, the mental safety um, of our community is such a key priority, has been certainly for the last 10 years and has been really for 160 years at Geelong Grammar, but with positive education, such a focus. Um, at the same time, there's this kind of paradoxical situation whereby schools are so focused at the moment um, on just the absolute pragmatics of remote learning you know how do we actually log into a zoom call and make sure the kids are there and that they're safe and how do i teach them algebra online you know there's this kind of absolute necessary focus on the practical um and so maybe this well-being stuff has taken a back seat so it's kind of got this front seat and back seat paradoxical situation at the moment is that what you've seen and if so how have you tried to address that in your role as being you know responsible for well-being of the, the you know the, the students particularly but also the staff in the school um I think that uh, in many ways, if you look at positive education and our approach at Geelong Grammar and others and other schools to equip young people with um, skills, explicit skills to support their well-being, I think this has been a time where um, we have a common context and we can actually draw on that toolkit that um, we have been, you know, trying to equip students with um, out of context, I suppose, very much in school. Um, so I think it's been an opportunity in many ways to um, remind them of those skills and strategies and practices that might help them navigate the remote learning context. Certainly that was a focus when we transitioned, when we, when we closed the school um, and transitioned to remote learning. It was about daily wellbeing messages, just as reminders as to these are the brain breaks that you can engage with. Here's some mindfulness practices. And just a thought for the day, basically, just a little bit of drip feeding to remind them um, that they have some autonomy and um, the ability to, to um, be quite proactive about their well-being. But I think probably what's been more important is the infrastructure that we've created um, to support student well-being. And I think that's, you know, intrinsically linked to the infrastructure that has been created to support learning. Um, you can't really separate the two. And just making sure as we transitioned to online learning that um, we had that pastoral infrastructure in place, we had um, remote counselling services in place, um, we had that regular contact with students so that we could really differentiate and identify what their needs are, both wellbeing and learning. That that was really important, I think. Um, and then through, through those um, channels, I suppose, we get a better understanding, as Chris has said, as to what, what the needs of our community are as we evolve um, through these phases of remote learning. So I don't think wellbeing has taken a back seat. I think we were really concerned, certainly at the outset, as to what impact remote learning would have on student wellbeing. Um, and so 
we there was a scurry of activity to develop resources and to develop our remote. We've, we've got a framework for remote well-being which has guided us. Um, I think kids are actually are doing on the whole better than perhaps we thought they might. Um, I think that you know that's not to undermine the the, the real distress that um, is being experienced in out in our communities at the moment and the impact that might be having on students, but. Um, I think they have been doing quite well with that infrastructure in place um, and also other initiatives that we are starting to run which really give them the opportunity to disconnect from the screen and to mm -hmm. engage in activities that are joyous, that are um, holistic in nature, that are um, engaging and that really do ensure that they're, um, they're addressing the need, their own wellbeing needs. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like it's very much been a, um, an integrated approach where you've been intentionally blending the kind of academic priorities and the wellbeing priorities and ensuring that they're intentionally kind of blurred and blended together. So, um, so th that's a, an interesting approach and I, I guess allows everyone to work together and there's been a kind of integrated task force, hasn't there, working on these approaches, which have have both you and Chris, you know, Chris with his really academic learning hat on and you and a, a number of members of the executive team and so forth working together to kind of to make sure there's a holistic integrated approach. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, and I don't think you should have any other kind of approach in a school. I think that, you know, the best kind of um, education we can provide for students is holistic and the best school leaders are not siloed off into their particular um, domain. Um, Chris, you know, in creating it, the infrastructure for remote learning had a very strong, um, he was very mindful of student wellbeing, I think, in creating that infrastructure. And then in the work I do around wellbeing, well, the strategies and practices that we are, you know, um, providing us, our community with really essentially support their learning as well. So it's just, yeah, I think, when you're all on the same page um, and you're all committed to all those elements of a mm. holistic education, that's, mm. that's when a school functions at its best, whether it's on the ground or remotely. Yeah. No, thank you. Chris, I'd love to um, just uh, ask you a question and that's um, reflecting on something Rebecca, that our principal, our head of school said recently. And um, as we know um, from working with Rebecca, she's a very strategic thinker, a long-term thinker. But by her own admission, a few weeks ago, she said that things are, we're, we're acting very, we're operating in a very reactive environment because of the situation we're in. It's, it's impossible, as you've explained, to really even think beyond two weeks um, in any really systematic way. Um, and so, obviously, we're making decisions on the fly, and they're informed decisions. They're informed by data, by gut feel, by experience. They're but they're still on the fly decisions. I wonder if you could share with us in hindsight, as you look back over the, over the last six weeks, maybe one decision that you've made that turned out really well um, and maybe one decision that you wish you could take back or wind back or just modify a little bit. Uh, I, well, I think one of the decisions we made really well at the start was to acknowledge that whatever we set up as a day-to-day -day structure for our students, would have to change, you know, if we were going to anticipate that we could be doing this all term, as the government had initially said, then we, then we, we knew that as, it, as we went on, it would be harder for our um, students to remain engaged in a, you know, kind of synchronous Zoom all day sort of sessions and hard for our staff to remain that way, um, that we would see levels of engagement drop at different times. We would find it, we would know that our students, it would be harder to remain motivated um, and, and that the level of work they produce would start to diminish because that's what we know happens when we're kind of caught in this remote sort of structure. So I think one of the decisions we made early was that, yes, we'll plan in a two-week process, but we know big picture this is what we need to be mindful, that we're constantly shifting in order to constantly address the engagement needs, the wellbeing needs, the focus needs, the motivation needs of our students and our teachers um, and kind of... So we move from a very synchronous program to a program where we kind of laid out work sequences a week in advance and kind of use the synchronous stuff as a tap in um, in, in different periods of time. And, and again, if and then we move to a two by two structure, which a couple of schools have done around the world to kind of free up one day a week for a bit more of a community connection because we know as long as it gets longer into it, that sense of connection and community 
starts to dissipate and we needed to be mindful that's one of the great gifts we have here is our sense of connection and sense of community we were going to have to structure that back in in a way that found the balance again between helping kids maintain progression with their work mm. but bring some joy back in and bring some connection back into mm. each other because that was the thing that they were going to struggle with the longer yeah. we were remote and the longer they were in isolation so i think that's one of the things we did well um yeah. knowing that these are the things we need to be mindful of as we continue to shift the model down the track before you before you, you share with us maybe the the one little uh one you'd like to wind back to, uh, chris you've just spoken about this this um Two two by two or two one two um, process that we've implemented recently in the last couple of weeks. This includes is affectionately titled Wacky Wednesday in our in our primary campuses. Just tell us a tiny bit about what Wacky Wednesdays is. So Wacky Wednesday at primary and the Wednesday challenge at secondary. Um, and again, it, it, we're not unique in this front, but this this came out of conversation with a couple of different schools about what our concerns were. Um, and like I said, being engaged with a couple of schools that were further into it than us was really helpful in terms of our thinking. Um, so, yeah, it's just an opportunity to free kids up from the academic space a little bit, give them a chance to recharge, connect in a really fun and engaging way. Um, at primary, they, there's different challenges they can sign up for. Um, we've done things like yoga and mindfulness for the whole community, so we've had parents engaged in that as well. I mean, I think the first session they did on a Wacky Wednesday, they had... Um, I think 300 people in, uh, online at one of our campuses, so lots of parents as well. Um, so it was just a great way to connect us all back to remembering who we are as a community. Uh, and the response from the teachers was that Thursday, the kids were so charged again and so ready yeah. for learning again in the academic process. Um, and at secondary, we're doing the same sort of thing. We've freed up, got a, sort of some adventure stuff and some um, creativity options, um, some challenges, competition challenges between each other that the kids can sign up for. And again, it's just, again, a day at which they can engage in some really fun community, joyful activities to recharge them and then free up the rest of their day away from a timetable um, yeah. to give themselves a chance to work on the priorities that are right for them, um, the things that are at the forefront of their mind that they need to work on that they might be falling behind in or they might need to devote some extra time to. Mm, thank you. So let me let me push you on this this um, this question of what what might you change, Chris? If you could wind back the clock and just do one thing a little bit differently, what would it be? Be having a big case on the wall that said, "In case of pandemic, break glass." <laughs> <laughs> the emergency plan. No, <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think uh, you know, in some respects, we'll, we'll do that review afterwards in, sure. in terms of looking back about you know what could we have done better or what would mm. we have done different. But I think at this point in time we're still kind of really responding to the challenge of what we're in at the moment and, and, um, and remembering to keep it, you know, trying to keep thinking mm. about adjusting. And, and the next plan is, you know, how do we come back on a site that's been announced today, that, that two weeks' time now seniors will come back into site and what does that look like for us and how do we plan for that? I think the time for, gee, we could have done this better and perhaps we shouldn't have done that, I think there'll be time for that later once, sure. <laughs> once we get to the other side. I, sure. I think we're too focused on let's keep planning and learning as we move forward at the moment. Yeah. No, fair enough, fair enough. Um, Rhiannon, can I ask you this question about the, the, um, the complexity of schools? I mean, schools are arguably one of the most hyper-connected human systems on the planet, like so complex. And part of the complexity comes from the different stakeholder groups, which have different priorities. So we have executives, sort of members, leadership team, and uh, teachers, students, parents, how have you tried to, in your role as a, a real leader of well-being in this school, how have you tried to reconcile all those needs and different priorities of parents and teachers and students and executive? And how ha have you kind of thought about that and tried to make sure everyone's needs were addressed? Uh, I suppose that it's, that's always a great tension and you never get that balance quite right. Um, but, you know, certainly... You know, our first focus really was on students and, you know, we've spoken a lot about everything we do, we place students at the centre. So student wellbeing, how we would support student wellbeing with the transition to remote learning, but then how parents can support their children was a part of that. So what resources, what, what support could we provide in that regard? What clarity could we provide around um, those support systems we had in place? Um, and I suppose for staff, 
there's been such a mad scramble getting things online that the best we could do and the most um, immediate support we could provide for staff wellbeing was around, first of all, transparency and clarity um, in relation to everything that we, um, every step that's been taken um, in response to our current reality, um, but as much support for staff as possible. So, you know, at, at the beginning, providing e-learning support um, for staff is probably a really helpful way to support staff wellbeing because that's the kind of, you know, um, crucial, crucial focus. And line manager support for staff who might be seen as vulnerable. Um, it's certainly been a challenging time for staff. Some have been thriving um, in this environment and, and some have obviously struggled. So, you know, in the last couple of weeks, a focus has been a little bit more on what proactively can we be doing for staff um, is it a wellbeing Wednesday focus? Um, can we can we provide some opportunities for those who want to engage in some more proactive um, practices to do so? So mm. I think, as I said, it's putting student wellbeing at the centre, but also understanding we have to support parents and we have to support staff as they support students, and understanding that this remote learning context um, has been wearing for many um, m m many facets of our community, but there's also been some really wonderful silver linings for all um, and how do we harness those and leverage those to really, um, you know, continue with all the iterations that we have, we are confronted with, you know, as Chris said, you know, it, it wasn't just the transition to remote learning, it's how we've tried to ensure that our remote learning experience is as, you know, um, a quality experience for students and now it's going to be what is, what is the wellbeing impact going to be on, on our school community as we transition back to school and things don't look the way that they looked before and then what does it look like in term three and we have to be very flexible and very agile and um and again coming back to i think something chris has raised at every step of the way doing the best we can to have our ear to the ground so we know what the needs of our school community are and um, they're going to shift and change as our context and our environment shifts and changes mm. Mm. Oh, I love that. I think one um, one uh, phrase that we've been throwing around a little bit in our office is this concept of, uh, and it sort of borrows from uh, Rebecca's uh, head of schools um, uh, um, meeting yesterday, where she spoke about the fact that Geelong Grammar will never be the same. Where this is, this is not. We have shifted. We have crossed the threshold, and therefore. The phrase we've been trying to play with is this idea of no kids coming back to school. So on 26th of May, no one's going back to school. Actually, they're going forward to school. That this we're not. There's nothing that's going to return. This is a very future-oriented look where we have to be, as you say, agile and nimble. You know, we're going to come forward, not back. We're going to come forward to a school where friendship groups have shifted and where you know parents. There's been family issues that have occurred at home and where there've been all sorts of disruption. You know, so it's a very different social environment, physical environment. It's, a, it's a, a such a, a complete shift in so many ways in the way we think about schooling and safety at school and so i think that agility is so crucial so on that point chris um and then i'd love you to answer as well rhiannon this concept that um we, we revert to a or we we come forward go back to a post-covid school environment um that's going to be different the question i'd like to uh, finally leave you with is um in five years time if we can just jump into a time machine we're, we're five years into future um, and uh, we're looking back, reflecting on this time, COVID, that we're going through right now, this pandemic. How do you think Geelong Grammar will be different in five years' time, Chris, uh, as a result of what we've learned, what we've experienced, what we've gone through during this time? How is Geelong Grammar in five years' time a different place to how it is now? Great question, David. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't feel too much yet, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... I I don't know. I mean, there's some key lessons learned, I think, from this experience. And, and you know, you can fall into a trap on a day-to-day -day basis of thinking what you do, everything about what you do is so incredibly important. And I think this, this sort of experience teaches you that, you know, maybe some of what we do isn't necessary um, and we can do things differently and, and we can be successful and it can be good for our kids and it can be more representative of the mm. context they actually live in today. So I think for me, some of the things that stand out for me are time 
and, and, and again, in schools, we love to organise time. You know, it's a great way to build compliance and lock everyone down is we, we structure time and we parcel it up into 50-minute lots or whatever. And I think that sense that we don't have to organise all of our kids' time, um, that, that maybe what we need to do is actually say maybe we can come to some sort of negotiated agreement where kids actually get to determine what they do with their time mm. and they're a better judge of it than we are as a school, um, that that they can control and be autonomous in their use of time and dedicate their time to the things that are right for them and rather than us saying you're only allowed to think, at ma- think about maths at 8.35 right. in this classroom when this teacher is here and only the maths that this teacher tells mm. you you're allowed to think about mm. and I'm not picking up maths. Um, <laughs> you know, but... but you know, we live in a world where, you know, when I grew up, if I wanted to watch a cartoon, it really was only on at 7.30 that morning. And if I didn't get to see it, I didn't get to see it. Whereas now, time doesn't mean a lot to kids, you know. Right. Everything's, everything's all over the place. They can, they can access what they want when they need it. Mm. And I think school has to reflect that. And we have mm. to trust that kids can organise mm. their time and, and be autonomous with that. And I think the other thing for me is about that notion of ownership on, of spaces. So... The, the online has, has, we've seen a lot of our kids really happy in the online. Some have struggled, but we've seen a lot of kids happy in the online because they understand that online spaces are democratised, they're not owned, they're shared spaces. And they've, our classroom space is really sickly, let's be honest, they're the teacher's mm-hmm. space um, mm-hmm. in the majority. And so kids are constantly at school walking into someone else's space what do I have to do in this space because that teacher owns this space and they set it up like this. And, and I think that sense of shared ownership of spaces and, and student spaces that students truly own and students c- truly control or their shared spaces between the truly shared spaces. And I think that will give our kids a great level of psychological safety mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. some kids don't experience when they're constantly working into someone else's space. This is their space. They behave like this. I'll need to do yeah. this and this. And I hope they're in this sort of mood today because then I'll be okay. Whereas if it's a shared space, like an online space is, and, or that we create those physical spaces here, I think we make our kids much more psychologically safe. Yeah. And when we feel psychologically safe, we take risks and yes. we learn better yeah. and, we, and we put ourselves out there to really stretch ourselves. When we don't yeah. feel psychologically safe, we don't do that. Sure. And as schools, we've got to make sure our kids feel psycho- psychologically safe in whatever ways we can do that. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Chris. I, I love that. I think, you know, when technology, as you're describing, is used at its best, it certainly plays a, it's a liberating force, isn't it, rather than a constricting force. And I think if we can harness technology in that way to liberate our students, it'd be fantastic in five years' time. R- Rhiannon, um, any final thoughts on John Grammar's? H- how's it going to be different for you in terms of the wellbeing space, do you think, maybe? I mean, I think I I echo everything that Chris has said. One of the great advantages of this experience has been that we have been able to lift off the kind of institutional structures that often um, suffocate us and make change really difficult in schools. Um, I think that the kind of... Uh, Geelong Grammar of the School, uh, Geelong Grammar of the Future really needs to be the kind of environment that reflects the world that they're going out into and I think that's um, really reflective of, of what, you know, what, what ingredients are required um, in the educational experience in the future to ensure that happens. For me, I just really want to continue on a path I'd already started on of making sure that wellbeing and positive education as one part of that wellbeing picture is um, meaningfully integrated in um, the day-to-day life of, of our school and in everything we do. I think that, um, you know, Chris was talking about psychological safety. It is that, you know, um, that that's key and I often talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we need to make sure that, you know, um, the experience for students is one which is safe um, and in which they can flourish and perhaps one of the, the learnings from our current context is that, when we're teaching students the explicit skills of wellbeing, they're so much more meaningful when they're contextualised and that's probably been one of the challenges of positive education in that often they're taught out of context. So I'd like to see us integrate those skills and practices um, in a more meaningful way in the day-to-day life of the school. Mm. And it's always, the you know, a part of the broader vision for me that we want our young people to go out and make a significant contribution to the world and to the betterment of our world and um, that that's kind of always what guides me and will continue to guide me 
Um, and I hope we have a little bit more clarity from this experience as to how we can make that a reality. Mm, mm. Lovely way to end. Rhiannon and Chris, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for all the work you've done here at Geelong Grammar School and that you've been willing to share with other schools um, around the world in your networks and in this um, little session today. Thank you so much. Stay well and good luck with the, the next few weeks as the, the next chapter, the next two weeks unfolds for you guys. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Cheers, guys.